Your son is blind. He will never, ever see. These are the words that my parents heard when I was all of three months of age. And as parents of a firstborn child, it came as quite a shock that their son was born without retinas. And of course, they went through the whole range of emotions from shock, despair, anger, grief, denial. But luckily, both for them and for me, they came to acceptance. And if it wasn't for their hard work, sacrifice, and enduring love, I wouldn't be who I am today, where I am today, and have the experiences I've had to date. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, CYP members. Thank you for coming out tonight. Tonight, I would like to touch on three key topics. Stepping out of your comfort zone, living your dreams, and the values of teamwork. Now, there, there are a ton of challenges as of you know, growing up blind and parents as, for parents as a blind person. And, and, and one of the first key ones is, well, well how the heck do you discipline uh, a child who can't see? <laughs> now, mo most kids, uh, if they step out of line, their parents, the parents will say, okay, you can't watch TV for a few days. <laughs> Not gonna work so well for me. I, I didn't watch TV. I didn't even know where the rem remote was. Um, so they found a very creative way of disciplining me as a very, as a young child. So whenever I, you know, broke any house rules or stepped out of line, they would just go and move the furniture on me. <laughs> Certain things also were rather upsetting to me as a child, and uh, namely the, uh, the time my mother told me that she was going to put uh, airplanes on my bedroom wall, and I thought, <laughs> that seemed like the coolest thing. I'd, I'd been, in, this is long before 9-11, where kids could actually crawl into the cockpits of airplanes and, uh, and uh, look at the different instrumentation. I thought, well, heck, that means when I get up at night, I'll, I'll be able to crawl into these airplanes and play around and help me go to sleep. And it wasn't until a week later that I came into the, to my room and started feeling the wall. because My mom had said she'd put the airplanes up. And much to, to my dismay and to her chagrin, they were wallpaper airplanes. <laughs> Yeah, there's a big disconnect between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional world. But to their credit, uh, my parents did put me in, in every and any other sport that any kid would, with sight uh, would do. Um, so there was the, the artsy things like the piano lessons, which only lasted for six months. Um, they went out and bought a piano. I guess they thought that I was going to be like Stevie Wonder or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my poor siblings had to take piano lessons as a result of that. <laughs> I played drums for two or three years until the insomniac neighbor next door complained because I played them at 7.15 in the morning. But I did really gravitate to sports, and the sport, first sport that I was put in was skiing. And just picture for a second, close your eyes, and picture yourself at the top of the cut on Grouse Mountain. And picture you've got to ski down that mountain with a guide yelling commands to you from behind. Left, right. Stop! You're going to fall down! <laughs> well, it worked. And uh, before I knew it, I was, uh, family was making trips to Whistler at spring break. And I remember being 10 years old uh, at the time and up on one spring day, break day and hearing the sound of dynamiting off to my right. And for those who don't know, that means that they're blasting for avalanches so that people can ski there later. And I turned to my guide, Doug, and say, Doug, where are they blasting? He said, oh, Donovan, I think that's up on the Sudan. I said, where's the Sudan? I'd never heard of it before. He proceeds to make the fatal mistake of telling me about the Sudan couloir, or the couloir extreme, as it's now known. The 57 degree angle run, steepest on the mountain. You have to hop a 12 foot cornice to get in. And chances are, if you fall going down there, you're not going to get up until you hit the bottom. Now, I've never been one to do things for the sake of proving something to others, but I've always been a very obsessive person. And when I get an idea in my head, it stays with me and stays with everybody else around me. And for the next week, I must have bugged the heck out of everybody. Why can't I ski the Sudan? I want to ski the Sudan. And I'm like, no way you're not skiing the Sudan. You fall on the blue runs. You're not strong enough to do that. So, well, I couldn't really argue. They were the guides. And so uh, I just kind of let that sit in the back of my mind. But every year when I went up skiing, I would revisit that. 
what about the Sudan? Let's take a look at the Sudan. And finally, at the age of 16, I had this guy, Jody, who had never skied with me before. And we're up on the mountain, and I, I told her about my ambition to ski the Sudan. And she says, okay. <laughs> Looks over the corners, said, you know, there'd been quite a bit of snow that year, so it was all filled in. And she says, let's do it. So I hop into the Sudan and make my way down the mountain. And you know what? I haven't looked back since. Whenever I go up to Whistler, and which will hopefully be this weekend, next time, I love to ski the steepest and deepest runs possible. But if it wasn't for my guide Jody back in the day for stepping out of her comfort zone and realizing that, heck, this kid's blind, but no reason why he can't ski, he's a strong guy, I would probably still be on the blue runs and maybe have lost my love for skiing because it had become so boring. The sport that a lot of people know me for, though, is, is swimming. And I started in swimming in a rather unusual way. Of course, my, my parents and their unusual child-rearing tactics had this great idea, so we'd rent a place in the, in the Okanagan in the summer, and my dad would have this rowboat, and he'd uh, row us out into the middle of the lake, and he'd pick me up, and he'd throw me into the water. <laughs> Holy smokes, who would do that to their blind child? I must have been three or four at the time. <laughs> Well, you don't, know the, the, uh, you don't know the half of it, because the, the toughest part about that was getting out of the bag. <laughs> no, it was, it was actually water... <laughs> he breathed a great sigh of relief. <laughs> it was actually water baby classes where I started, bobbing up and down to nursery rhymes, which soon graduated to swim lessons, which then graduated to my father and I going to the pool a couple of times a week, and him being an ex-swimmer, uh, I was eight at the time. He says, well, how about we race from one side of the pool to the other? And that really instilled in me a fire for competition because I'd be able to swim the lengths in, you know, one week was 25 seconds and the next it was 24. And I thought, this is cool. I'm starting to get faster. And when the, our local swim coach approached us and suggested I join the swim team, I, I jumped at the opportunity. You know, what better way to meet some more people my age and pursue a sport I love. So I, I joined the team, I continued to improve, and at age 12 I ended, entered my first ever provincial championships in Kamloops, the BC Games for Athletes with a Disability. And at those games, I met a couple of people who were off to Atlanta th that summer to compete in the Paralympics. Up until that time, I had no idea that such a thing existed for people with disabilities. I, had, I knew about the Olympics, everybody knew what the Olympics war, were, but the Paralympics at that time were not a very well-known movement. But it kind of stuck in my mind that, you know, if I continue to train and to improve, maybe one day I'll be standing on a podium representing Canada. And, you know, I did continue to, to improve. I, I made nationals for the next three years in a row. I entered high school. Uh, and then in, in the summer of 1999, the coaches who had been coaching me for my formative years uh, decided they wanted to start a, start a family and couldn't afford the time of coaching me anymore. And I was kind of, you know, left up a creek without a paddle, as it were, uh, wondering how I was going to pursue this swimming. And my dad stepped forward, who's always been a, uh, one of my biggest mentors and friends, and he said, son, I know you want to make the Paralympic team. I'm willing to help you do so. I'm willing to train with you before you go to school and before I go to work. And uh, let's see if we can make it to Sydney, Australia. I thought about it for a couple weeks. I was in kind of a funk at that time in life. I needed a challenge. I needed something to aim for. And finally I said, sure, Dad, let's give this a shot. And that was the best decision I ever made in my life. Ultimately, it began one of the most unique journeys I've ever had, especially for that first year because I was getting up every morning before school to train, about 5.30 in the morning. I'd be in the pool for an hour and a half. I'd go off to school. I was in grade 10 at the time. I'd usually sleep through my first class. <laughs> Nobody would notice my eyes were closed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's just when I started drooling that the teacher kind of <laughs> shook their head. But, but somehow my marks were improving because I would usually stay after school to get my homework done and. Uh, you know, couldn't start it at 9 o'clock at night anymore. I had to be up all over again at 5.30 the next morning. So marks were improving. I was getting faster in the pool. And ultimately, that next summer, I accomplished my goal. And I made it onto the Paralympic team 
and found out that I would be representing Sydney at the age of 16. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I couldn't believe I'd made it. But after the dust settled and after I, I came down from my high, I thought, well, I've made it this far. There's got to be something else to aim for. And the next step was the podium. Why not get on the podium at my first ever Paralympic Games and win a medal for Canada? And before I knew it, I was traveling to Sydney in the Paralympic Village, eight square city blocks filled with 136 different countries and people speaking in different languages, very overwhelming. And this food tent you walk into that's just a block long, like a huge football field that's got everything from pasta to Australian lamb to a McDonald's tucked away in the corner that we weren't allowed to visit. <laughs> but we did. <laughs> anyway, before I knew it, it was my first race, the 200 IM, which is for those who don't swim, it's uh, 50 meters of butterfly, then backstroke, then breaststroke, and then front crawl or freestyle. My best chance at winning a medal, my first Paralympic race, and I swam the preliminaries in the morning, and it wasn't my best race. I felt fatigued afterwards. The time wasn't what I expected, but I was placed fourth going into the finals. And man, that day, I had never been more nervous. I was jittery, I was shaking. I could barely close my eyes for a nap. Thankfully, my dad gave me a pep talk before going to the pool. I got in, I warmed up, I got my massage, plugged in, listened to some tunes, and before I knew it, the gun was going off. <laughs> Bang! And I dove into the water. And I had the most amazing feeling. I was almost picturing myself two meters above the water, going through the motions of the swimming, of the strokes, while this other Donovan swam the race below me. It felt like I was in a flow, in a groove. It almost felt easy, but by no means was it easy because I came into that wall and I found out that I'd made a personal best time by no less than three seconds. And I come into that wall and the first, the first question I asked the volunteer on deck was, well, what place did I come in? Third, she said. Third echoed through my mind. And I could not believe it, that I this 16-year-old blind kid who had been told by coaches a year before didn't even have the body type of a competitive athlete. I had defied a lot of people's odds, not to mention my own, made it onto the Paralympic team and won a bronze medal at my first ever Paralympics. Not just for myself, but for Canada. I had won a medal for my country and I have a lot of, I've had a lot of successes since, since then. I won two, bron two silvers and a bronze at the uh, Athens Paralympic Games. A bronze medal in Beijing in 2008. Carried the flag into the opening ceremonies at the 2008 Games. But I've never, ever r forget that feeling of winning my first, first ever medal for Canada. And believe it or not, I'm still competing. But in the past six years, my life has taken another side trip. And that all started leading into the Beijing Games, my third Games, when uh, my neighbor, who ran an insurance, runs an insurance agency, Gord Buntain, found out that I was doing some work for the Royal Bank and said, Donovan, why don't you come and join our firm? Join Buntain Insurance and uh, why don't you become a travel insurance expert? And at first I kind of poo-pooed the idea because I've, I've always been interested in communications, uh, I was very, almost ready to go into radio broadcasting straight out of high school. Thankfully, my parents encouraged me to get a university degree. But here was somebody offering me a job, basically giving me a job, saying how we're going to make it work. And what could I say but yes. And this began another chapter in my life, which is still going on to this day. And let me tell you, starting in an office job, um, with new co-workers, actually one of them happens to be here tonight, Jesse John. Right, right, right. right there, Jesse and I started on the same day together at Buntain Insurance and um, we worked together and he can attest to the fact that starting in a new office where systems weren't in place and um, it was all coming together can be about quite disconcerting for anybody. But when you can't see what's around you, it's even worse. Now, I was not only adjusting to office life, but also adjusting to new systems, which didn't always work with my speaking software. I have a special software called JAWS, which reads the computer, reads everything that's on the screen. 
I was getting used to office politics, which are a whole world into itself when you're, you know, the only guys in an office full of girls. And I was facing my nemesis, which was paperwork. <laughs> Nothing worse to a blind guy than a stack of papers on his desk that he can't read. But, you know, as time progressed, uh, I realized and I started to get frust I was frustrated at first because I was thinking, how can I do all this stuff? There's so many things I don't know how to do. There's so many things that are not accessible to me, and not to mention keeping track of all this paper. But to his credit, my boss, Gord Buntain, is a visionary and has always been a team player. And he said, Donovan, you know, you don't have to do the paperwork. We're going to assign you somebody in the office, so when you have any paper that comes across your desk, they'll tell you what it is and they'll help you file it. And okay, maybe you can't do um, ICBC, so when people come in to do their, their auto plan renewals, because the systems aren't quite that accessible. You ask one of your team members to help you out and you split the, split the commission. And finally, as we continued to do that and continued to proceed, I realized that there was such a benefit in working with a team. I didn't need to do it all myself. I could turn to Jesse or one of the girls in the office and say, hey, can you assist me with this? and we can share the work and we can share the commission. For me, as somebody who's used to functioning on a very independent level, that lesson in teamwork and working with others was one of the most integral uh, to me, to my development as a person. And I'm still in the insurance game. And over the past few years, I've realized that, yeah, I, might, I may suck at doing paperwork and I may not be the best guy to do your ICBC renewals, but I love sales. I love getting out there and talking to people and building relationships. So I've learned to focus on those strengths, getting out there, being with people, getting to know people, and let the people back at the office who have working eyes handle the back end and the paperwork. So going from, and going from being in a, an athlete to a, an office worker has really taught me quite a few lessons. And I think just the, the takeaways before I sign off here from, from today is, Always, always surround yourself with supportive people. You know, I couldn't have got to where I am today without my parents or the friends I have now to this day. I surround myself with supportive, interesting people who push me to be the best I can, kick my ass when I'm not, but also are just there for me unconditionally. And if you can do that, you will become the best person that you can be. Also, always look for solutions. There's, there's always problems that come, come up and always challenges. But when you sit down and stop and think about it, there's usually a workaround or something to make it work. And I found that there's been very few problems that, yeah, they might take some work and some thinking and some problem solving and some teamwork, but I'm usually able to tackle them. And finally, always follow your dreams. If you have something in your mind that you believe you want to do, or something that you believe you want to be, whether it's the best father, the best coworker, the best team player that you can do, then you will make it happen. In the words of Henry Ford, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. If you, if you, if you think you can't do something, you're going to put walls up around you, you're going to fall flat on your face, you will not achieve your goals. But on the other hand, if you, in your heart of hearts and in your mind, believe that you can do something then, you will do it. Thanks very much.